Oh. Oh, thanks very much. Um, so Conrad did a very nice job of, of introducing some of the concepts around ecosystem connectivity. It's connectivity in ecosystems that makes it a system rather than a, con than a set of non-connected parts. And systems act differently than the individual components. So understanding those, connect those connectivities, those connections between the parts of an ecosystem are a key part of, of, um, of underpinning successful management. So I wanted to start off by, by thanking the challenge for giving me the opportunity uh, to develop a program on ecosystem connectivity. And um, uh, I, I think back to the, to the beginnings of the challenge in, in 2013, and my selective memory um, picks out a couple of themes that, that, that really hit home for me. One was that the challenge has a 10-year lifespan. And in 10 years, we need to be training scientists in multidisciplinary science to, to confront some of these problems that face New Zealand. And, and I've, I've taken that to heart. And, and this program really, um, really supports quite, quite a few of those young scientists and, and uh, developing skill, multidisciplinary skills. Um, also, uh, it, it involves a, a, a series of, of scientists uh, listed here. Dave Shield, Jeff Shima, uh, Russell Frew, and Kim Hageman. Uh, Frew and Hageman are both chemists um, who, who have multidisciplinary skills in, in solving these, these problems of connectivity. And we've looked across a variety of different systems, from pelagic ecosystems to, uh, to estuaries to rocky coasts. We live in a, a world that's changing. And, um, in, in our short two-year field program, we've seen a major earthquake at Kaikoura. We've seen cyclones. We've seen bomb lows. We've seen the largest marine heat wave ever to be recorded in New Zealand. Um, last summer, it was beautiful, glorious, warm summer. And um, living down in Otago, we should have thought something's wrong. Um, but that heat wave is twice as long in duration and twice, twice as intense in, in, uh, in heat content of any other heat wave that's been recorded. These are the kinds of extreme events that really challenge ecosystem connectivity, and they challenge uh, those connections that, uh, that bind ecosystems together. So I've got a series of examples of projects we've been doing. Uh, each one of them is linked to a poster, and each one of them has uh, a person who's, who's uh, led the research. They're sitting all over there, uh, graduate students in the program. And I'm just going to give you a very short overview of, of these. Uh, they'll be very brief. Um, and, but if you want to see more detail, you can, you can link to the poster. I want to acknowledge the late um, Keith Hunter for this first one. He was instrumental in, in supporting this research. Um, and this goes out into the pelagic ecosystem. Now, the largest migration of life on Earth occurs on a daily basis between the deep scattering layer of the ocean and the surface. And all those things that live down in the twilight zone of the ocean move up into the surface layers at night. And they carry with them nutrients. Out in the subantarctic waters off our southeast coast, it's iron-limited system. Productivity is limited by iron. The amount of iron that's brought up by these organisms swimming to the surface is five orders of magnitude higher than background levels. And movement of that iron into the surface waters can influence productivity. So for example, if 10% of the iron that's brought up by these migrating animals was used for productivity, it would increase that by 500%. The composition of that community will change under a changing ocean. And this will in impact productivity of our coasts. That productivity gets swept into estuaries, gets swept into the coast. And we've been looking at connectivity between that coastal zone and estuarine environments. So here what we've done is we've instrumented the mouth of Waitati Inlet, which sits within a Taipuri. Waitati Inlet supports a commercial cockle fishery. And we've summed up the productivity, the, the phytoplankton that comes into the inlet during an incoming tide and what comes out of the inlet during an outgoing tide. The difference is the consumption, the net consumption. It ignores all those interesting processes that are going on inside the inlet. But it gives you an idea of what's consumed by the cockle population and, and other things within the inlet. 
That follows a type two functional response, which means that there's a saturating level, and the number is about 50% of, of the organic matter is used. So the population is consuming about 50% of what's available. This could be a biological reference point. You could say, we want it to consume 80%. You would have to increase the size of the population to do that. Right now, we use growth rates as a biological reference point. We've also um, interacted with a tipping points program a, a bit to look at um, the other part of the problem, which is uh, benthic productivity. This is what our estuary looks, at, looks like at the moment. Um, it's got this huge bloom of ulva going on, and there's a, a difference in the, um, the consumption of this detrital mass by this um, clam macamona versus the, um, versus the cockle population. And we've looked at this uh, interaction between this, this difference in pelagic production versus benthic uh, detrital production coming into these two clam populations across a series of estuaries up in this area versus, versus down south. And, um, and that interaction uh, will be highly influenced by the relative amounts of benthic and pelagic production in the system. Um, moving on from that, uh, we've been looking at time series of, of temperature variability within the system. We've got a 60-year record. And from that, you can calculate the, um, the oxygen saturation point uh, within estuarine waters. There's been a baseline shift in that oxygen saturation point. And here, looking at, uh, ah, I kept pressing the wrong button. Uh, here, looking at um, the oxygen saturation point from back in the 60s versus during this heat wave event, you've got this, this baseline shift in the amount of oxygen saturation. We've done a, um, uh, a laboratory experiment looking at the susceptibility of cockles to different durations of, of anoxic events. And there's essentially a, a cliff in terms of their susceptibility to, to uh, oxygen depletion events. So at a particular duration, the whole population dies. We're interested in when that occurs uh, relative to this, uh, this baseline uh, saturation event. Following on from that, we're looking at some of the populations of bivalves in, in the Marlborough Sounds. This is another developing project um, where we've looked at the, um, the trophic position of the cockle populations in different parts of the Marlborough Sounds. So here's a bunch of different sites spread across the system, and we're seeing tremendous plasticity in terms of the organic matter sources for those populations from different environments. Um, we're going to be now looking at some of the heavy metal loading in these different populations. Um, one of the things that comes out with cockles is those living around salmon farms have a, have a large input of waste material from salmon farm operations. And uh, uh, Rebecca McMullen has a project where we've been quantifying the fluxes of that waste material as a measure of the footprint of the farm. So we can quantify using stable isotope analysis, we can quantify not just the change in the community around the farm, but how much material is moving into that community on a per area basis. And this gives you another way to measure the footprint of that input. Salmon farming represents another input into a food web um, rather than mussel farming, which is just redirection of, a, of an input that's already there. So new material coming into the, uh, into the system we can track through the natural food web. And here what Rebecca's done is she's uh, at four different farms. She's looked at the amount of material that's moving into uh, positions close to the farm, away from the farm in a reference site, into the whole benthic community. Now, along with that material, there's potential for there being some contaminants that move into the system, because aquafeed can be sourced from all over the world, even including countries that don't prescribe to the Stockholm Agreement, countries like the US. Um, and there are materials that can move in that we, you don't necessarily want in your food chain. So here's some preliminary results um, looking at blue cod that are resident around farms versus reference sites. These are some current use pesticides on the far, um, on the far left there. These are some banned pesticides. Um, 
If you Google chlordane, it's something you definitely don't want in your feed web. Um, and these are some banned PCBs. Um, we're seeing some associations, particularly with PCBs, uh, to, to these farm sites. And our next question is, where are they coming from? Moving on to um, some of the patterns in, in fisheries, uh, Leo is working on a project to look at the, the history of, of industrialized fishing in New Zealand, and he's been particularly um, successful in, in, in gathering some collaborations, both with Niwa and Te Papa. He's looked at patterns in, in the trophic structure of fisheries through the history of the fisheries, and using this trawl survey on the east coast of New Zealand, we've looked at changes in the trophic structure of that whole community. And there have been some drops in the trophic structure as those large, uh, long-lived predatory fish um, drop out of the system. The other collaboration, which I think is really cool, is he's gone into the, the fish collection at, at Te Papa and sampled individual species going back in time. So he's got some species going back as early as 2000, no, 1910. Yeah. Um, so you can look at the change in the trophic structure of individual species, species like Hapako, which have been lost from the coastal zone and moved out into the pelagic zone. And um, what he sees is that uh, pre-1980, there's a, a real shift in the trophic structure of the whole community. Um, There's been a shift in uh, essentially the niche of the whole community between uh, the pre-1980 and, and after 1980 uh, fisheries. Now we've known for a long time that um, individual fish uh, reproduction scales with body mass and it scales geometrically with body mass. So large fish can provide hundreds or even thousands of times the reproduction uh, as smaller fish. One thing that's becoming more and more clear is that it's not just the size, but it's the maturity of those fish. Uh, Stina Kolesky has a project where we're looking at the relationship between maternal age and survivorship of larvae. Um, and what she's finding is that old mums are the best mums. They produce larvae that are at higher quality and more likely to survive than young mums. This has important implications for how we manage fisheries and maintain size, uh, age structure within fisheries. Uh, finally, we have a project uh, that um, Craig alluded to looking at uh, kelp forest um, productivity. We, we know and have known for a long time that kelp forests are critical habitats for fish, and they provide shelter and, and, um, and, and habitat. They also provide organic matter. Can man pointed this out in 1977. Um, but uh, that organic matter we can now trace into those communities. So we've done what I think is quite an innovative thing, which is we've taken density information, converted it to biomass per unit area, and then done a model for the organic matter that supports that biomass. We've compared two different regions, Fjordland versus the Marba Sands, and divided the fish into those that are exploited and non-exploited. And it turns out that those large, high, um, high trophic level omnivores that we all like to eat use a huge amount of kelp forest productivity uh, to support their populations because they have a very diet and they eat a lot of grazers. Um, and the implications for loss or change in kelp forest habitat are, are large. This is a related project, and one of the things about degradation is, is it's a good idea to know where you've been um, in the history of, of your ecosystem. And so we're collaborating with some, some archaeologists and going back uh, into the, the records going back to 700 years ago, getting fish bones and ding, ding, uh, getting fish bones, isolating the, the collagen from those fish bones, getting isotopic information from that collagen, and we're able to recreate what the trophic level of key fisheries fish have been going back 700, 300, 100 years, and the present day. So we're able to see what, what trophic levels, what, what food webs looked like um, in the past. So finally, I just had to um, sort of think back to when I was in school, and the first paper that I uh, helped publish was with a fellow called Jim Quinn, and the first line of that paper was, 
One of the most basic requirements of intelligent resource conservation is to anticipate and prevent ecological collapses. In order to do that, we need to understand ecosystem connectivity, and we need to focus on those processes that connect ecosystems rather than simply the pattern of distribution of organisms.